Hi, everyone, and welcome back to Unfiltered with Phil Rosenberg. I am your host, of course, Phil Rosenberg, and today we have a very interesting show. We're going to talk to Jamil Sheikh, a fascinating guy. And uh, although Jamil heralds from the world of finance and his resume is really littered with time spent in the big banking houses like Bank of America, JP Morgan, and Citibank, he's also been an adjunct professor variously at Columbia University, NYU, and CUNY. Currently, he's teaching data science and graduate level blockchain studies. Mr. Sheikh has authored a book in the same space called Mastering Corda, which currently resides on the Amazon 100 best selling list. Jamil is also the founder and CEO of Chainhouse, a company specializing in digital asset management. Uh, when you talk about digital assets, of course, the cryptos, Bitcoin, Ethereum, and Dogecoin come to mind, these having entered into the lexicon of popular culture. But that's a discussion of currency. And today, instead, we're going to talk about what that currency can buy you. Perfect place to start. So I have a hypothetical question for you, right? You're walking down the street with your buddy who, let's imagine they're a Luddite. And he turns to you and he says, I've been listening to the news and watching uh, stuff on TV and they're talking about NFTs, but I don't know what the heck they are. Can you tell me what is an NFT for someone that isn't really familiar with the world of technology that is not, is not on the cutting edge? Yeah, sure. I mean, so to understand what NFT is, you need to understand what blockchain is and what effectively a blockchain is, that's a kind of quick definition is, it solves two problems. One, the problem of double spend, which is if I send you a PDF file, I still have that PDF file. Therefore, that PDF file will eventually have zero value. Uh, but if I create a, a digital thing like a PDF file on a blockchain and I send it to you, I no longer have that digital thing. Therefore, the probability of that digital thing having any value over zero dollars, that probability is greater than zero itself. So that means there is this economy that can emerge, a digital economy. So blockchain allows you to have a digital economy. Uh, and the other problem that blockchain solves is that there is no need for an intermediary, right? We can solve this digital economy problem as long as we have an intermediary that's keeping a ledger of who has what digital asset or, or mm -hmm. digital thing. Uh, and if we want to eliminate that intermediary, uh, we have to do, use a whole set of algorithms and technology and blockchain does that exactly. But so now I have, a, I, li I live in this world, in this blockchain world where it's decentralized. And if I send you a digital thingamajig, I no longer have it. Just much like if I give you a $5 bill, I no longer have it. And so blockchain solves that. So this digital thingamajig, we can call it a token. Uh, uh, Bitcoin is an example of a token. A token can mean whatever it, you want it to mean. People try to define a token to have certain specific purposes. Uh, Ethereum, which is another uh, blockchain, has their own tokens. And you can create your own tokens on these blockchains. An NFT is a specific... Did you say Ethereum was a blockchain or a type of cryptocurrency? So Ethereum is a blockchain and they have their own native cryptocurrency. Oh, interesting. Ether, or ETH for short. Uh, but uh, NFT is a specific type of token that uh, associated with it is a unique identifier, kind of mm -hmm. like a serial number, right? And that token can represent anything that you want it to represent as long as we all agree that it represents that. Much like when you have a car and a license plate and the license plate represents that car uh, or your registration of that car. Uh, and we all agree as a society that that represents that, right? So an NFT effectively at the most fundamental level is a token, something that I can trade that points to something. Today, the major use case or the most commonly heard about use case is the pointer is to some image or some video, uh, these crypto punks and, you know, board ape yacht and all that uh, stuff, but it can point to a municipal bond. It can point to a credit default swap. It can point to a shipping container. It can point to all kinds of things. And if I trade that token, as long as I have the right legal framework around it, I can trade real world assets, or I can just keep trading those digital assets natively without it pointing to anything in the real world. So this is exactly the point that needs to be made here or the question that needs to be asked. Recently, Keanu Reeves said they're easily reproduced when asked about NFTs and their value. So is yeah. he misunderstanding the nature and scope of NFTs? If so, how? 
Um, short answer, yes. Um, so, so the idea is that, hey, I can just copy, download and copy a JPEG that an NFT points to. So why would an NFT that points to a JPEG sell for anything more than, any, you know, real, real money? Why would it sell for real money? $100,000, $5,000, 2000 I can just download it and store it in my, on my hard drive. And this goes to the idea of provenance, right? And provenance is a very deep subject. Um, but if we break provenance down into its components, provenance is made of uh, the, the creator, the person that created that thing, uh, uh, and, and the chain of custody behind it, the story behind it, the community, right? And you put all of that together and you have provenance. If I were to take a Mona Lisa, let's say we, we, were walk, we walked in front of the Mona Lisa, Phil, and... I took a screenshot with my phone and said, "Hey, look, I've got it. I've got the Mona Lisa now. Do you want to buy it off of me?" Your answer is going to be no. But I've made an exact copy. Even if I took the Mona Lisa and made it an atomically identical copy of the Mona Lisa, it would not be the same Mona Lisa, right? I could do a sure. quote unquote copy, exact copy, because the second Mona Lisa is not the same as the first. Why is the first matter? Because Leonardo da Vinci's hands did touch the first one. He painted that. He touched it. There's a story around it. There's a community around it. There's a chain of custody that the community knows about uh, regarding that, right? right? And so that is what creates everything in humanity. If you look, for example, if I give you an example, like um, if you were the only person that lived on this, on this planet, nobody else existed, what would it mean for you? Like, what would you own on this planet? Like, what do you own? Right? And some people are going to say everything and some people are going to say nothing. So what it means is that the concept of ownership is, is derived from the idea of community, from society, right? We have society and therefore there is this concept of ownership, which is different from possession. So when you download a JPEG, you possess a copy of it, but you're not the owner of it. Uh, and what blockchain allows you to do is more efficiently, more effectively arrive at provenance for any asset today it's very very digital but it will it's migrating into the real world uh, and i can ascertain the chain of custody i can ascertain provenance and the cost of provenance or ascertaining provenance goes down if i have a painting and i think it's a mona lisa and i walk into christie's and say can you please make sure can you check if this is the real thing they're not going to do it for free they're going to charge me i don't know fifty thousand a hundred thousand dollars to do the provenance work and they'll come back and say, well, it's not right. And I just lost a hundred thousand dollars with the blockchain. I can trace very quickly if an asset, whether it's a digital image or if it's a real world business asset, a municipal bond, whether that bond was issued by Goldman Sachs or was it issued by some guy in the basement with a dog to, mm -hmm. well, they, this person issued, I can trace that and verify that. And the cost of that provenance and traceability is negligible. So the the short answer is that it's basically electronic based provenance. Is that how far off am I? It's it's electronic. It's consensus based, right? There is consensus. There is agreement. Uh, it's transparent, meaning that people can look at it and say, "Well, that's not the case. That that person is not the author." It's community based, right? So p the community is coming together and saying yes, right? And the blockchain preserves that decision-making process, that provenance of that decision, because it's a collective decision, there's a consensus around it. So um, there's community around it. Uh, but what, prom what blockchain does is gives you this community coming together saying, yeah, this is in fact the provenance of this. So not only am I getting a digital version of the provenance, I'm getting all these other additional value add around that. Mm -hmm. So, you're obviously hip deep into the world of NFTs and very familiar with blockchain and probably the entire new technology, the metaverse, I want to say. I want, I'm just sort of wondering, like, what NFTs do you personally own? You know, and as a side question, as an aside, like, which, if you own several, are you most proud of and are you most likely to show to your friends and family or, you know, at a dinner party? Um, so I don't own any of the popular NFTs. I own NFTs that are related to business assets. So, I, for example, I'm building a platform called Instament 
that is a that allows you to mint NFTs, but it's for B2B. <clears throat> and so my thesis is in 10 years, all B2B commerce will be NFT based. So if I send you an invoice, it's going to be NFTs, right? And mm-hmm. uh, I personally am not very familiar with the art world and things like that. So uh, I'm kind of reluctant to pick up uh, uh, let's say a crypto punk for a hundred thousand dollars. I understand. But as you know, as we know, the art art is beauty is in the eye, eye of the beholder. So if somebody buys something for a hundred thousand dollars, I'm like, I understand it. I don't. Yeah. But I'm not a collector, an art collector. I am involved in the metaverse, right? So mm-hmm. I, I, I am doing stuff in Decentraland. Um, and I've got, you know, I'm doing stuff in, in, with, with Sandbox and a couple of things. Can you just describe what is Decentraland and Sandbox for our audience in case they're not familiar? Yeah, so if you're familiar with these games like uh, Second Life, um, and you know, where these kind of like you join a video game and there are other people that are real uh, uh, people, and, but they have their avatars in the game. Uh, and uh, so Decentraland and Sandbox, they're examples of games like Sa- uh, Second Life. But they, you can trade when these games, you can buy assets, you can buy an axe, you can buy a gun, you can buy all these kinds of things. Uh, but those assets are traded as NFTs, right? And so I'm collecting those kinds of things. You can buy digital land. Um, and a lot of people are like, well, why, why would you buy that? Uh, but those are the things that I'm collecting. So I'm collecting things where in this metaverse and because we, when you look at the metaverse, um, we are basically saying, Hey, this is another way for a community to get together and agree that things could have value. And if we look at these games like Roblox and these other games that a lot of people are playing, things do have value. I want to buy an ax, special ax that can break a special kind of wall and I'll pay $5 for it. People are doing it and, and there's billions of dollars exchanging uh, in that. So, so the, meta, the meta, well, only thing the metaverse does it, is instead of being there being an intermediary um, that's clearing and settling the trades, the blockchain is clearing and settling the trades. Gotcha. So in hindsight, are, is there, are there any NFTs that you thought, well, maybe I'll buy this, decided not to, and then realized, oh, I should have I got on board with that? Yeah, in hindsight, everything. <laughs> right. Uh, if, if it's a hundred thousand and I was, it was fifty dollars. I could have bought it. Of course. Is there anything uh, particular that like sticks out in your mind? Like, oh, here's one that I really wanted. I was going to pull the trigger. I didn't do it, and now I'm really just watching someone else reap the benefit of my mistake. That kind of yes, thing. So you know, there's a, there was a crypto punk. Um, I forget the number. Uh, and and uh, uh, it's you, you know um, Logan Paul um, picked it up. Uh, and is that the uh, fighter? So you've, yeah, the oh, fighter. The, oh, Jake the, he, Paul. He, he, Jake Paul. Yeah, Jake Paul. But they're brothers, Jake Paul and Logan Paul. Oh, okay. But but, but there was one crypto punk that um, he picked up. Uh, I, I was very interested in that crypto punk. I wanted to get it before he picked it up, um, and that was a very interesting one. They're YouTube stars, right? And now they got into into boxing. Gotcha. So we talked about some of the uses for NFTs, and I think they've been primarily personal, right? Like how do you use NFTs? How does any individual utilize the technology of NFTs? I'm wondering though, how does, how do NFTs enter the corporate world? What is it in the corporate world that is attractive or that are, why are they attracted to NFTs? There's a lot of talking about trades being done with them. You just mentioned some types, but what, what is the bigger connection? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so, um, so NFT represents anything, um, can represent anything. So, uh, in many ways, we as humans, we each are an NFT. I'm completely different from you, Phil. I'm completely different from my own brother, right? Our DNAs are different. Our fingerprints are different. My fingerprint is an NFT, right? Uh, we, NFTs are integral into who we are. When I sign a document, a digitally sign a document, or if I sign a document on paper, that's an NFT, right? Uh, anybody can copy and paste that, but it's still not, my, it's not my signature, right? So the provenance of that's important. So NFTs exist in business in its fundamental uh, definition and sense, right? They already exist in business. When you buy a credit default swap, you're effectively buying a unique asset, right? So all business assets are unique. They have some unique identifier. The only thing that doesn't have unique identifiers is currency. They're fungible, right? A dollar is a dollar. 
uh, and the crypto world started with that. It could have started with NFTs and we would have been in a different space today. But uh, mm. NFTs represent any digital asset. It can represent any business asset. It can represent a piece of property. Uh, the benefit of NFT is that when I trade it, as long as the legal infrastructure is there, the framework's there, um, that when I sell a token to you and it represents a house and you buy it, Phil, that settlement time and the friction to close uh, on that deal um, is significantly reduced, going from, let's say, weeks to like maybe even minutes, right? I can sell you a house in minutes. Uh, and so that's what the, the business world and the corporate world sees. We can start to trade assets. Yeah. Uh, and I can see, like, uh, you know, for example, in real estate, a big deal is title insurance. I want to see, uh, I want to see the chain of custody on this property. And I buy a property and somebody from pops up and said, well, this property was uh, given to me for by my great, great, great grandfather 200 years ago. And now you have a problem. So if you don't have title insurance, you have a big problem. Um, your title insurance covers those kind of potential claims. Uh, but what title insurance companies do is they do these title searches, nasty, archaic, messy process that's not always definitive. Mm -hmm. Uh, and a blockchain, when you transact real estate, you're building this chain of custody. Uh, and uh, all of a sudden, you can see, well, going back, I can see all of the owners of this property. So there's all these benefits of moving business onto blockchain. And yeah. that those business assets will be represented as NFTs. So we see that the big banking houses have opened crypto desks. So there's trading of crypto at uh, BOA. JP and so on. I wonder, does that exist anywhere just for NFTs? Like, are there, are there anywhere in the banking world or the world of, of trading stocks or bonds or whatever other trades there might be? Is there such thing as an NFT desk in the proper trading space, like where otherwise stocks would be bought and sold, for example? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I never really thought about that. Uh, I don't know of one. Uh, I don't know of a banking uh, trading floor where they're like, okay, this is an NFT area and we're going to be trading crypto punks and things like that. Mm -hmm. But I don't think we're too far from that, right? That's not unreasonable uh, because uh, banks do trade and invest in art and other things as well. Mm -hmm. uh, and this would be no different. Maybe at this point, it's still a little premature uh, and the banks are, are trying to understand this market a little better. And I think we're going to, it's going to, uh, mature over the coming years, but there's no reason why, because banks are looking to arbitrage and make money by buy, buy low, sell high. This would only actually make it easier for them to get, get involved. So you've seen the NFT process happen. You've been a part of it and you've seen many myriad uses for NFTs. What are some of the more interesting and creative uses that maybe the public has not heard of? We've all heard about people, some folks have heard about some real estate transactions happening, both in where the blockchain is used for titles, but also for things like Second Life or in the metaverse, right? Like you can buy real estate in the metaverse. Like we've kind of heard of those things. What are some stuff that we might not have heard of that are that's out there using NFTs? You know, I, I think uh, you'll see, you know, this entire world of education shift to NFTs. So when you get a degree, Right, we'll see that as an NFT. I, I get a diploma, or I get a my you know my master's degree. Like my, I'm I'm working on my second master's right now at, in in AI at Georgia Tech. I would love for them to like give me that that degree as an as an NFT. You know, I think the use cases are still emerging. It will be fairly prevalent and kind of you'll see in ten years it's going to be the norm. At that in ten years we're just not going to say we're not going to call it NFTs. It's just it's just going to be plumbing underneath and, and everything will be uh, basically an NFT or token. It'll just be NFT. like a normal transaction. There'll be no need to say NFT will be redundant because everyone will know that you're saying yeah. everyone will know. So that yeah. kind of leads me into my next question. So what's on the horizon? What are we going to see NFTs used for next? That not not quite there yet, but that we're looking at. The intersection of decentralized finance and NFTs is emerging, right? Which is how can I create financial instruments that have, let's say, a coupon? They they, they pay an interest rate out, and it's tradable as an asset. I think that that's going to be that's emerging, and we're going to see that growth this year. And then if I take NFTs. Um, that have value, 
uh, can I use them as collateral, right? Can I put it up um, in some place and earn earn a yield on it? Uh, I think we're going to start to see more and more of that this year and next year and, you know, kind of very near future. Um, so I think all these financial use cases are, are going to emerge around NFTs. So NFTs right now is like the art world kicked the door down. Yeah. Uh, uh, but the financial world is picking up uh, and coming and saying, well, these are all these other things that we could do with it. So let me ask you today, since you mentioned collateral, is it possible to use an NFT as collateral for a loan? Will a bank give me a loan of $150,000 or a million dollars or $10 million based on like, let's say, so Beeple sold his, all his stuff, was it 69 million or tens yeah. of millions of dollars, right? So if I owned all of that stuff, could I use it as collateral and say, take out a $20 million loan, do you think? So there's a lot of, there's a lot of challenges with that, right? Yeah. Um, Cause valuation is very, very subjective here, right? So in, in the financial world, valuation is a function of cash flow. So you can value property, you can value all these things based on how much cash flow you can generate. You value equities, a DCF model based on equities, uh, based on cash flow, right? Uh, and that doesn't exist in the NFT world. It's an, a virtual asset. So um, the, right now, the banks are not going to take it as collateral. They're not even taking cryptos as collateral, right? Um, you can't even put up a, st a stable coin as collateral and get a loan against it. In the in the traditional banking world, uh, you I think you will see it as collateral first in the crypto world. There'll be places where you can take an NFT and, and stake it, but the that world will require massive amounts of over collateralization, and there needs to be very strong valuation mechanisms. The fact that a Beeple sold for sixty nine million dollars will not mean that you can take that NFT. Uh, and put it as collateral worth $69 million, $70 million. You know, there's going to be massive haircuts on that, right, to reduce that. So Let's just you, take a stab, though. Could you, if I owned all that stuff, $69 million worth of people, could I get a $10 million loan, do you think? Today, no. No. Right, right now, no. Uh, what do you think I could get, just off the top of your head? You just take a guess. Probably nothing at this right. stage. Okay. Yeah, probably at this stage, nothing. Especially. With so we're not there people. yet. We're okay. not, we're not, yeah, we're not there yet. But okay. um, if I had a municipal bond that was issued by Goldman Sachs as an NFT, yeah. can I put that up as a collateral? Um, and therefore, municipal bond. Yeah, yeah, I would I'm think so. I would yeah, think yeah. yes would be the answer. Yeah, and if I can do it instantaneously, and the provenance of that municipal bond is verifiable instantaneously, then I can put it up on, as collateral pretty quickly and pull out liquidity for myself as a stable coin, hmm. right? So if I, let's say I have a, a municipal bond that normally trades for $10 million, I put up as collateral, maybe I can pull out, let's say there's some ratio, collateral ratio, I can pull out maybe, let's say $7, seven million, maybe $5 million yeah. as a stable coin and I can use it for something else, right? Got it, got it. So that world is coming. All right, well, Jamil, I wanna thank you very much for joining me today. It has been incredibly interesting and super duper informative. And I hope that you'll come back in six months and we can see where we are because the world of NFTs and the metaverse is moving so quickly that in six months, we're probably gonna have an entirely new discussion around all of this. Yeah, we, maybe we could do it in the metaverse next time. Ooh, wouldn't that be cool? Let's aim for that, that's a great idea. Sounds good. All right, once again, thank you very much, Jamil. Have a wonderful day and we'll be speaking soon. Thank you so much.